so close and yet so far. It's from Matthew. Matthew 10, okay, it's from starting Matthew. at verse 5 and until verse 23. We just got a little... I, yes, yeah. you do. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's still from Matthew. Yes. These 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not open, welcome you or listen to your words, leave that town or that home and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before the governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will, be, it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. This is the word of God for the people of God. Indeed. There's a popular theory that all decisions that we make are based either in fear or in love. That's an interesting idea to tease out, right? One of the two, fear or love. Author John McGee writes, there is no neutrality. If it is not love, then it must be fear. There are only two primary emotions, love and fear. Every decision or choice that we make comes from a place of love or fear. We cannot feel these two emotions together as they are opposites, he says. Love-based emotions include hope, joy, gratitude, peace, faith, trust, confidence, happiness, connection, forgiveness, openness, passion, freedom, harmony, honesty, beauty, compassion, self-love, self-appreciation, respect, acceptance, understanding, and so forth. But fear-based emotions include anger, grief, shame, guilt, bitterness, 
judgment, jealousy, frustration, doubt, insecurity. If we do not actively seek to make decisions out of love, then we will be doing so from fear and become subject to its component feelings. That is the end of what he writes. Hang on one second. I'm going to get my very big image off this very big screen. I feel better. I hope some of you do too. It's hard in the sanctuary when there's two of me and one is a little bit lagged. So friends, as I understand it, fear is located in the frontal cortex of our brain, the amygdala, or what we sometimes call the lizard brain. It's the oldest part of that organ in our evolutionary process, and it's the part that allows us to survive. It's actually a really great component, necessary component to have. It is, though, the part that has a fight, flee, or freeze response. And when we are deeply afraid, when our lives are at stake, when we are in survival mode, that portion of the brain takes over, takes over everything, so that we stay alive. Now, that's a very good thing, right? Those four kids that they rescued in Colombia this week after 40 days in the jungle, I know that I wouldn't have survived, not because I don't have a strong frontal cortex, but because I really have no idea how to survive without a house and a grocery store. But I like to think that my frontal cortex in that moment might have helped be a compelling component in my survival. In folks who struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder, one of the biggest challenges is the disruption of brain chemistry. In the wake of a traumatic experience or experiences, the frontal lobe stops connecting or doesn't connect quite properly with the other parts of the brain where reason and logic and love exist. A significant part of recovering from PTSD is doing things that help reestablish those synapses. It's really hard work. It's, it's really hard. But it's worth it. Because living like there is danger around every corner is not living. Patrina, if you want, there's Sunday Patrina. If you want, there's Sunday school with Miss Siobhan. She's here today. In our scripture lesson this morning, Jesus commissions his 12 disciples to liberate and enliven the harassed and the helpless. Seeing the multitudes of sheep without a shepherd, Jesus is deeply moved, and so he tells his disciples, go. Go and proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Go and cure the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out demons. Go and touch the untouchables. Go and heal. Go and resurrect. Go and make peace. As theologian and author Debbie Thomas writes and reminds us, needless to say, this commissioning is for us as well. Are you scared yet? Because hang on, Jesus has more to say. After explaining to the disciples what their task is, he offers them some appalling operating instructions. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag. Don't take two tunics or an extra pair of sandals or a walking staff. And, saving the zinger for last, I'm sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. You will be dragged before governors. You will be handed over to councils and flogged. You will be hated by all because of my name. 
Notice that in this speech, Jesus doesn't say, who's with me? They've all already pledged allegiance. And this isn't the 70 going out in pairs. This is the 12 who, we didn't read it this morning, but they are called out by name in the verse immediately preceding this. It's a list. Lest we be confused about who is commissioned to go. And they're called by name and their stories of being called are told to us so that we know that they are fishermen and tax collectors and farmers and your average Joes. These are the 12 who are called out and commissioned. It's a hard message in the gospel this morning. It is a confrontational message and also a really honest message. As my friend Bruce Reyes Chow likes to say, it's all that simple and it's all that hard. It is simple, really. Go to the people that you know, the people that you love, the people with whom you have the most in common, and tell them what you believe. And tell them why you believe what you believe. That's simple, right? People we know, people we love, we know the customs, we know the language. We don't need to feel uncomfortable like an outsider, but we will feel vulnerable as though we've brought absolutely nothing with us. No armor, no protection, no easy out. And that's hard. It is simple. Go with good intentions and a kind and gentle heart. This isn't about your own wins and losses. Share what you believe. Share the peace of Christ. And if people accept it and can hear it and receive it, so much the better. And if they can't, that's okay, because that's between them and God. But you have done what you were asked to do. So shrug your shoulders. Shake the dust off your feet and keep on moving. Keep on moving, even with the people that you love. Don't let their discomfort stop you. That's hard. It is simple. You don't have to have a fundraising campaign. You don't have to take a bunch of stuff with you. And you don't have to have some fancy degree in order to be prepared to tell people what you believe. What you believe about the God that you know. You can go just as you are right now. God will give you the openings. God will give you the words to say. And the opportunities that you need to show God's love in this world. To show God's deep compassionate, abiding love in this world. You just have to trust. That's hard. And here's the kicker. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Know that they will come after you and know that I will be with you. Wise as serpents. We read that in. I bet most of us, if you're like me, maybe you're not like me, but that serpent, it's the initial story from the Garden of Eden, right? The serpent who says to Eve, oh, it's really okay if you eat from this tree. The serpent who's pretty cunning and knows how to talk to Eve. We think about that serpent, that reptile, that part of the brain that is the oldest part that teaches us directions to go, how to survive. But also be innocent as doves. The part that overrides all of that hard experience that symbolizes pure love. 
Doves, you remember, are what are offered as sacrifices in the temple. Connect those two parts. It'll be scary. But know that I am with you, Jesus says. Live in that. It's all that simple. And it's all that hard. Beloved, as we prepare to celebrate our 130th anniversary, and as we envision our future as a congregation, will we be governed by fear or by love? Will our decisions come from a place of abject survival or from sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world? Will we be ruled by insecurity, doubt, grief, shame, or guilt? Or will we lead with hope, joy, gratitude, peace, faith, trust, confidence, happiness, connection, forgiveness, openness, passion, freedom, harmony, honesty, beauty, compassion, self-love, self-appreciation, respect, acceptance, understanding, and the list goes on. Now, I know that some of us might be saying this morning that even logic and, writ and, and reason are not mixed in there, and that should be an option, too. After all, we are Presbyterian, and we like to lead with reason and logic. We like to create study groups, do multiple surveys, get feedback, make recommendations, think about things for a while. Or as my mother, who was a lifelong and most devoted Presbyterian, would have said, or procrastinate. As you look at the ethos of the Presbyterian Church, would you say that we leave with, lead with hope and joy and compassion and peace? From where I sit, it often looks like it's based in fear. Fear that we might make the wrong choice. Fear that we might leave others behind. Fear that we might fail. that we might lose. But beloved, when we make decisions out of fear, I absolutely guarantee you we will lose. That is loss right there. That is a loss. It may not look or feel like loss initially, but it's a huge loss. Because there is no in-between. You can imagine you're not making a decision out of fear, but if you're not making the decision out of love, it's fear. It's like abstaining in a congregational vote. Abstains get counted as no's. You have to make a choice for love. And love is not just an emotion. Love is an action verb. And in the Bible especially, it is an action verb that is mostly an action verb in the Bible. English doesn't quite get that. But Greek, which most of the New Testament is written in, Greek has four different words for love, and the one that's used the most is an action verb. When we make decisions out of love, Love wins. Love beats fear. Love beats hate. Friends, love beats death. There is no fear in love, as the first letter of John reminds us, as is printed in big letters on the cover of your bulletin today. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. There is, that is why, friends, that gay pride is so important. That's why anti-racism training to be a better ally to our siblings of color is so important. 
It's not about a rainbow flag that you put up for a month and then take down, or a class that you take, check the box, done that. It's an ongoing process. It's not about lawn signs or cute pins or fabulous stickers. We cannot check a box and move on. July 1st will come and our LGBTQAI plus siblings will still want to know if we are a welcoming, affirming, loving, embracing, uplifting church. The people that are in our congregation who self-identify as queer will want to know if this can be something that's more than just the month of June. They will want to know if this is a place where they can be honest about who they are and who they love and how they understand themselves in the world. It is not one and done. It is hard work. But it is what God calls us to do. And I know that we can do it. And I know that we can do it together. And I know that we have to do it together. Friends, love wins always, hands down, no exceptions. There is no fear in love. May it be so. Amen.